uh, like everything this year, we've had to do things a little bit differently. So thus we're here for a series of short online seminars. My name's Ben Holmes. I'm the Biodiversity Project Officer with the Wimmera Catchment Management Authority. I'm new to the, a new addition to the Biodiversity Seminar Committee and I can take little to no credit for this year's event. So um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, a massive thank you to all the committee. They've done a wonderful job of putting this together. Um, so well done team, everyone can give them a little bit of a silent clap. Um, so here in the Wimmera, we operate primarily on the lands of the Wajabolic community. So that's made up of the Wajabolic, the Jabwa, Jabajala, Jali, um, Wagaya and Jabagalt people. So I'd like to thank their elders who have looked after this land for eons and those who continue to do so today. And I very much look forward to seeing the next generation of leaders to continue that great work. So thank you. And welcome to any of the Wajibolic or other First Nations people that are joining us today. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the support of Bank Australia, um, Beringi Gadjan Land Council, the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, Project Platypus, Trust for Nature, the Wimmera CMA and the Yari Ambat Yak Land Care Network for their support. Without their contribution, we wouldn't be able to make this event happen. Um, so now we'll just move on to a few housekeeping uh, issues. Um, so as I've already said a number of times, if you can keep your uh, microphones on mute and turn your videos off, that'll just make the seminar run a lot more smoothly for everyone. Um, if you are using Microsoft Teams, um, please open the chat box and we'll be adding information in there and that's where you'll ask questions. Um, as a facilitator, I'll take note of all the good questions and then present them to the presenters uh, once they've finished their presentation. Um, if you are viewing on YouTube and you have a question, you can email us at Wimra Biodiversity Seminar, or one word, at hotmail.com. Um, I'll get someone to throw that link in the chats as well. Um, and please don't, don't record this presentation. Um, if you would like to view the session again later, it'll be available on the SWIFT website. Um, some presenters have not asked have asked for their presentations not to be recorded, so we want to respect those wishes. Um, if you have any troubles with Microsoft Teams or on social media or anything, please email email us again at that email address, Wimmera Biodiversity Seminar at hotmail.com. It's just popped up in the um, comments section there. Um, now, before any questions, uh, I'll address the main one, the mugs, the um, beautiful uh, mugs that we get made up every year for the Biodiversity Seminar. So this year, the first 75 people who are registered will get some mugs. Um, we're still trying to work out how we're going to get those mugs to people. Uh, it's a little bit difficult at this point in time, as you can imagine, with um, the lockdown and the pandemic. So uh, we've got your names and details. We'll be in contact with you shortly on how to get those. Um, secondly, at the end of the survey, we'll have at the end of the presentation, we'll have a survey. Um, so we'd really appreciate it if you can fill out that survey to give us some information on how we can develop and adapt and uh, make the biodiversity seminar even better next year. Um, We've got a special announcement before our first guest speaker um, from Costa, who joined us for the 20th Biodiversity Seminar, who has agreed to be the official ambassador of the Wimmer Biodiversity Seminar. So he's provided us with a quick video to share with you now. It. Can't see the video coming up. Um, so we might move on and we'll put that video on in uh, between the guest speakers. Um, so for the fourth se for, so our biodiversity seminar theme this year is from little things. And today's session we've got focused on mammals. So our first presenter is Emily. She's currently conducting her PhD at La Trobe University. Um, and she's investigating a number of the key aspects around threatened species, captive breeding ecology, um, and how to reintroduce, reintroduce and translocate these species. Um, and she's using fat-tailed dunnarts in the Victorian gra grasslands as a model species. So without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Emily. Hi, thank, Hi, you, thank so you so much. much. 
Okay, let me work out my screen. Is that working for you guys? Yes, thanks Emily. Brilliant, no worries at all. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today at the Wimmera Biodiversity Conference. Um, I'd just like to say a quick shout out to my beautiful grandparents in the audience. I haven't seen you guys in so long because of the Melbourne lockdown, but thank you so much for coming today. Uh, so my name's Emily Sakluna and I'm a PhD candidate at La Trobe University. I work in reintroduction biology and my study species is the fat-tailed dunnart. So we know that anthropogenic disturbances such as landscape modification and destruction of habitat, uh, as well as the introduction of both invasive predators and competitors, are major drivers in the endangerment of Australian mammals. Grasslands are among the most endangered ecosystems on the planet, with uh, less than 1% of Victorian grasslands remaining. While feral cats and foxes are responsible for considerable population declines of grassland fauna, so mammals, birds, reptiles, invertebrates inclusive, the overwhelming factor prompting the dramatic decline of Victorian grassland species is simply the loss of appropriate habitat. So let's look at the features of our basalt grasslands. We've got a native community of plants which is dominated by tussock forming grasses and in between those tussock forming grasses are intertussock spaces. We've then got basalt rocks, quite fertile soils, we've got seasonal water logging over the winter and then we've got soil cracking over the summer. There's a lot of writing here so please don't um, focus on the on the names and more so look at how long that list is. Since European settlement Australia has lost six, uh, 92 species to extinction. 92 species. Of those 30 were mammals. Of those 30 mammals 26 were either entirely dependent or in some way utilised Victorian grasslands. So for the species that are still occurring in this region, dramatic range reductions are continuing to occur. So introducing my study species, the fat-tailed dunnart, they're a member of Daziuridae family, which means they're carnivorous marsupials, and they predominantly eat insects and small vertebrates. So they eat all of those um, agricultural pest species pretty much. They're a nocturnal species and they're widespread across Australia. They're around the size of a house mouse, but they live under, they live under rocks, logs, discarded fence palings, the odd corrugated iron sheet is where you're most likely to find them. So they're renowned for being the only small ground dwelling mammal to persist in grassland ecosystems across Victoria. And importantly, they're also renowned for being able to persist in agricultural landscapes. So Cooper et al published this map showing the distribution of a proposed difference between fat-tailed dunnart subspecies. They describe Smithopsis crassigodata centralis as the subspecies that occupies predominantly arid areas of Australia. And then there's Smithopsis crassigodata crassigodata, which occupies uh, predominantly grassland areas. So that's the one that we have in Victoria. We only have the one subspecies. The current conservation classifications of fat-tailed dunnarts do not consider these as two separate subspecies. So they look at the entire species distribution when they classify it. In my opinion, that's a problem because the two subspecies occupy vastly different habitats um, and therefore have vastly different threats. However, because the classifications look at the species as a whole, the fat-tailed dunnart is classified as least concern internationally on the IUCN red list, and they're classified as near threatened in Victoria. These classifications are based off records collected across the country. So I'd like to highlight that the last targeted surveys for this species occurred in Victoria in 1976 by Morton. And this was at the site of the largest known population of this species, which was at Western Treatment Plant. So unfortunately, the reality is these listings don't have much relevance for the conservation uh, of this species or this su separate subspecies because they're not actually li listed on any federal or state statutory documents. So as I mentioned, the last major surveys were conducted by Steve Morton in 1972 to 1976, and his Victorian sites were located at Western Treatment Plant. So here we have a, oh my, I'm having some technical difficulties. Here we have a hand-drawn map of, um, from Morton's thesis, which shows each of the sites that Morton uh, surveyed during that time. Oh, I'm losing my screen. 
I'll just reshare. Sorry, everyone. Okay, we'll share again, we'll see how we go. I hope I've got it. Please yell out if um, that's still playing up. What's a presentation without minor hiccups? So this hand-drawn map was part of Morton's thesis and he recorded over 700 fat-tailed dunnark captures at these four sites um, after surveying monthly for four years. So I contacted Melbourne Water and asked if I could access these sites for surveying. And everyone I had contact with was really supportive of my efforts. So the green areas on this map are still managed as grasslands. And um, although all of this land is still run by Melbourne Water, unfortunately, two of his main sites have been leased for agriculture and the landscape has been stripped of rocks for cropping. One of the two remaining sites was cleared for the construction of grain silos. So that left one site, which did happen to be Morton's main study site. So this map on the left was another hand-drawn map from Morton's thesis, showing every animal and the rock he found it under at site one. So I used a similar survey protocol to Morton over the course of 12 months. However, I also added additional um, artificial habitat in the form of roof tiles to increase my chances of finding them. So in total, I surveyed 250 pre-existing rocks in the landscape, and I also set up five transects of roof tiles, each over one kilometre long each, um, to a total of 180 roof tiles. So these are Morton's results, showing the average amount of animals he caught per month across the four years of his study. I set out with the intentions of adding another line to this graph to show how the species abundance may have changed at this study site over time. So here are my results. In case you missed it, there it is. I did not find a single individual scat or nest, no signs of this species in one year of surveying the site that was once Victoria's largest fat-tailed dunnark population. So to break this down further, when I commenced surveying, I knew it wasn't peak, peak season for the dunnarts and the weather was not, uh, it was extremely hot at the time. So I wasn't expecting them to be out on the surface as much. I wasn't um, you know, I hadn't given up hope despite being disappointed that I wasn't finding them. By the time May came and went, however, um, the month that Morton recorded an average of 89 fat-tailed dunnarts per survey, I started to get pretty concerned that I wasn't finding anything. I guess I'd anticipated a reduction in the population size, but I really wasn't expecting there to be no signs of them, um, considering this site is still well known to support a, a persisting population of the species. July through to October is peak breeding season. So if there are going to be fat-tailed dunnarts present in a landscape, um, this is the timing I would expect to see them, given they're out and about trying to find their mates. By this time, I still wasn't finding any signs of them. So that solidified my concerns for this species persistence in that landscape. So I'll now go through previous direct and indirect evidence of fat-tailed dunnart persistence at the site, starting with all other surveys conducted at Western Treatment Plant. So it's important to note that aside from Morton's major surveys from 1972 to 1976, all other recordings of this species have been incidental, which means that they weren't targeting this species in particular. And while they're not comparable survey efforts, it still does show a decline in the species abundance. So we have Morton's 700 uh, plus captures. Then we have in 1987, 133 captures by Schultz. We have 15 captures by Coulson in 1989. 94, we had zero captures by Ecology Australia. And 2002, we had zero captures by Cropper. 2003, we had 10 captures by Biosis. 2005, five captures by Ecology Partners. 2008, one deceased fat-tailed dunnart was located by William Steele, who's a collaborator of mine. 2010, we had, um, there were six captures recorded by Ecology Australia. And then 2019 was my survey. So just pointing out there, the last records of um, fat-tailed dunnarts at, at 
you know, in, in an ecological survey at this site was actually now a decade ago. So that leads me into another way of tracking this species. Birds of prey regurgitate undigestible material in the form of a pellet. And this is a great non-invasive way of identifying mammalian prey. So in 1972 and 73, Morton also collected owl pellets from roosts near his main site as part of his study. And he found that of all the prey items in these pellets, the Dunarts made up 1.3%. So he was finding them as prey items. From 79 to 80, Baker Gab looked at owl pellets from the same site, the same roosts, and found that the Dunarts made up 2% of prey items. From 2008 to 2012, collaborators of mine at Melbourne Water collected owl pellets from the same roosts as these previous surveys, found absolutely no traces of fat-tailed dunnart in any of them. So in conclusion, I've collected both direct and indirect evidence that shows a dramatic population decline of this species at the very site that all the literature still states is one of Victoria's largest populations of this species. So I've set out to update the conservation status um, of this subspecies in particular and draw more attention to the fact that the two subspecies of fat-tailed dunnarts occupy entirely different habitats and therefore have different threats. I spoke to the current Threatened Species Commissioner, Dr Sally Box, and I also spoke to the IUCN Red List Mammal Advisory Committee, both at conferences last year. They both gave me the same information, which was that I need two years of survey data over the entire species distribution to get any movement happening, which for this species is most states of the country. Needless to say, I don't currently have that ability during my PhD. However, I am now in communication with DELP and I'm leading the effort to get this subspecies on the statutory list that will increase um, its conservation status and, and efforts associated with that in Victoria. So that's a great place to start. So why the population decline? Well, we know that foxes and cats are to blame for immense population declines in our small mammals, inclusive of fat-tailed dunnarts, but this is not new information and it certainly isn't a new threat since the last surveys for this species. Something we use to control cats and foxes is 1080. Now, this poison is placed in the landscape in meat baits and given the dunnarts are carnivores, it's not a question of whether or not they would eat it because they definitely would, but it's a question of whether or not this poison would kill them. I've read literature that states that it does, and I've read literature that states that it doesn't. Um, so I'm not yet convinced on what the answer is for this one. The biggest problem here is the removal of rocks. Dunarts can and will thrive in degraded landscapes, you know, or, or agricultural landscapes, but once farmland is stripped of rocks, dunarts have nowhere to hide. The other factor I believe has led to this immense decline is the absence of both fire and grazing. So without appropriate fire regimes or grazing in, a, in grassland landscapes, what we're seeing is complete ecosystem structural change, which I'll explain more thoroughly in a second. But basically our native grasslands are looking less and less like the left image and more and more like the right, which is a problem. So let's revisit the features of a basalt grassland. We have our native community of plants. We've got tussock forming grasses into tussock spaces our basalt rocks, fertile soils, water logging and soil cracking. So let's start with our intertussic spaces. Well, pretty self-explanatory name. They are in fact the spaces that are inter in between these tussocks and these allow our fat-tailed dunnarts to get out, move in the landscape and to find their prey items. So this is also important for um, other native species of grasslands, not just this species. With the influx of invasive weeds and grasses, for example, Phalaris, Chilean needlegrass, serrated tussock, et cetera, we're seeing this invasive vegetation filling in these integral intertussock spaces and changing the structure of grasslands. So when Morton conducted his surveys in the 70s, he recorded the grass at Western Treatment Plant being 60 centimetres at the highest. Um, and the landscape was still being grazed by sheep at the time of, he did this research. So it's still, it wasn't a pristine grassland, it still was um, a somewhat agricultural landscape. When I go out there now, however, to that is exact sites, there's no sheep and the grassland looks very different because the grass is almost as tall as me in some areas. So that Phalaris, et cetera, is taking over. So planned burns on both public and private properties are happening less and less due to um, reduction in appropriate climatic windows. But when they do happen, they're great at eliminating those invasive weeds and keeping our natives going. So planned burns are integral for maintaining these grasslands. <laughs> 
Grazing is often considered to be a negative in the ecology space, but as far as maintaining grassland ecosystem structure, grazing is definitely better than nothing in the absence of fire. So if we don't have fire, grazing is, um, you know, it's our next best thing. Grazing keeps these introduced and native grasses lower and helps to somewhat maintain these intertussic spaces and therefore the grassland structure. So our soil cracks are the next um, component. These open up predominantly in the summer months when the ground gets really hot and dries up and conveniently they appear at the in the hot weather which allows Dunarts um, and their food sources a perfect cool little home to avoid the heat. So they're integral for this species. Basalt rocks are our next important part of the ecosystem. So Dunarts don't dig tunnels straight into the earth. They dig under rocks or woody debris or utilise those soil cracks. Uh, so one of the biggest problems Dunarts face is this rock removal. If rocks need to be moved, if they can at least uh, be placed all in one position in the landscape or along fence lines, wherever it's most convenient. But if they're put somewhere, then the Dunarts still have some kind of, of habitat. So this is a summary of what our average grazed landscape looks like. We have our invasive vegetation, but we also have sheep keeping that down, somewhat maintaining the structural integrity of the grassland um, by allowing those intertussic spaces to occur. As long as we have our basalt rocks and or soil cracks, then we still have an ecosystem that allows fat-tailed dunnup presence. So now let's consider the other type of agricultural land use, and that is our cropping so cropping involves a, a monoculture plantation and obviously removal of the native plant species that were existing there prior. It also means a range of land management practices, so rock removal, grading, tillage, drilling, leaching, fertilising, saturation, irrigation, pesticide use, unnatural burning regimes. I'm sure you guys know more than me, but what this does is completely changes the soil profile so that it doesn't crack or waterlog in the seasons that it naturally does and it doesn't allow anywhere for the Dunarts to hide because the rocks have been removed and as have the soil cracks. 55% of Victoria is freehold agricultural land, which means that the majority of somewhat appropriate land for uh, in the state for fat-tailed Dunarts is privately owned, which is often farming properties. Climate change is affecting our agricultural industry. And I'm very fearful that although fat-tailed Dunarts have been able to persist in some agricultural landscapes up until this point, this has been dependent on the availability of suitable uh, shelter sites and habitat for foraging. As global temperatures and levels of carbon dioxide rise, in addition to more variable rainfall, Victorian farmers are seeing an increase in days where livestock may experience heat stress. Heat stressed animals exhibit reduction in appetite and less likelihood of breeding. So pressure is put on farmers to accommodate this change in climate. Increasing temperature, however, has also been found to increase ryegrass toxicity. Um, and considering this is a popular choice of feed for livestock, this increases the likelihood of severe health implications, with, which is also problematic for livestock. Meanwhile, elevated carbon dioxide has also been found to increase wheat grain yield and plant biomass, which is a positive for crop farmers. It's been predicted that Victoria may see an increase in cropping and decrease in livestock agricultural practices as farmers are forced to accommodate the implications of changing climate. So cropped prod paddocks are well and truly uh, less appropriate for fat-tailed dunnart presence because, you know, there's, there's simply no habitat for them in those in those ecosystems. Whereas grazed ecosystems um, at least you know, leave their rocks and their, their intertussic spaces and um, soil cracks. Another problem is that farmers of livestock are more likely to invest in actively removing uh, invasive predators, so cats and foxes from the landscape, as they, they pose an economic threat to the livelihood of these farmers through preying on their livestock. So landholders who use the land for cropping, I, I fear might be less likely to see value um, unless from a conservation perspective, in spending their, their time and money removing these invasive predators, as these feral species are less likely to have negative implications on their, on their livelihood. So that could be another problem. Okay, so just to summarise, this is what our basalt grassland, you know, predominantly looks like. This is our ideal fat-tailed dunnart habitat. This is what our basalt grasslands look like with invasive vegetation. There's still, um, you know, an ecosystem that the fat-tailed dunnarts can live in. 
our grazed ecosystems, so our agricultural land with livestock. Our sheep keep some of those intertussic spaces there. You know, if the basalt um, rocks are still in the landscape, then the dunarts are doing fine. Cropping, there doesn't leave much room at all for fat-tailed dunarts in that ecosystem. So I'll just bring up my timeline from Western Treatment Plant again and talk about the land changes that have occurred here. So the removal of sheep, last burns, removal of rock, um, because the same events that occurred at Western Treatment Plant are occurring across the Victorian grasslands. So firstly, I recently found out that to the best of Melbourne Water's knowledge, none of the four sites that Morton studied have ever been burnt in the time that Melbourne Water have managed the land. As I mentioned earlier, lack of appropriate climatic windows is not allowing these planned burns to occur. And this is on both private and public property. So it's not an isolated issue. Then I found out when exactly these landscapes were transformed. So when those sites were pretty much demolished, basically between 2000 and 2013, the sites were ploughed and levelled. Um, and as it stands, the last signs of dance were somewhere in the middle of that. So I want to emphasise that the same mistakes are being made across Victoria. We're removing habitat without realising the species is even there. Um, and ecosystems are changing rapidly because of climatic variants, which is a huge problem for fat-tailed dunarts. Uh, my first conclusion is the importance of revisiting historic surveys, because everyone I spoke to and every book I read told me that Western Treatment Plant was the place to go to for fat-tailed dunarts. And everyone assumed they were still there because that's what the last records said. But the last species specific records were 50 years ago. Um, so I found no dunarts there and I wasn't even, there wasn't even time to try and work out why this was happening because historic surveys weren't revisited in that time. It's imperative for the survival of our species um, that conservation statuses are up to date. So this is incredibly challenging, uh, an incredibly challenging responsibility considering how rapidly our environment changes and, you know, keeping our policies up to date with that. But it is um, a task that we need to keep on top of nonetheless. I believe it's definitely time to view these as two separate subspecies with very different threats. So the Victorian grasslands have suffered extensive habitat destruction compared to the rest of arid Australia. And that means the animals in this ecosystem are more likely to be threatened. An example of my point on this is the helmeted honey eater, which is one of Zoos Victoria's focal species for conservation. Zoos Vic have spent over 2.5 million over the past five years. And this is in fact, not a critically endangered species. It's a critically endangered subspecies of the very common and quite readily seen yellow tufted honey eater. So imagine what would happen if we actually broke these into two separate subspecies and looked at them more clearly that way, we may end up getting a different conservation story. My fear is that without focusing on the fact that they're different subspecies and in different ecosystems, um, we may very well lose this subspecies forever and it's gonna happen right in front of us. Focusing on these three points will then ensure that the limited resources we do have, uh, time, money, et cetera, go to the right places. And my last point is that my Western treatment plant research, I think is a really good case study for looking at a trend that's occurring over the rest of the state as well. So given the majority of this subspecies populations exists on privately owned agricultural land, it's really important to understand what the predicted land use changes in Victoria will mean for this species. Thank you all so much for inviting me to present in this seminar series and thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Fascinating. Fascinating. No worries. <laughs> um, uh, I've got a quick question. So yeah. zones are not a huge component of particularly the northern Wimmera landscape. Um, so is it, I'm assuming it's coarse woody debris that would be filling that ecological niche? Um, and what things should we be looking for in, in our landscape? Because we've got plenty of grasslands up this way, yep. um, two being um, affected dramatically by agricultural production and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. We have, I had noticed a comment there, um, one of our participants, Julie, that we found some up on their property up near the desert. Um, over oh, last amazing. Um, and I've found some as well on one of our properties as well. So what kind of things should we be looking for in the Wimmera? I'm just trying, sorry, I'm just trying to get you so that I can actually see you on my screen. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, Awesome question. So I think the places you need to be looking for, 
is those, you know, those rock walls that often line agricultural, um, you know, properties, no rock walls. <laughs> well, they're one place, but any kind of rocks that you found out and about, definitely woody debris, logs, they love that kind of thing. In the absence of logs, um, you know, old, 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 um, what are they called? Fence palings, that kind of thing. To be honest, any kind of debris, so old, you know, corrugate, corrugated iron sheets, that kind of thing, they really do take up residence under pretty much anything. They're, they're pretty resourceful. Um, as I said, with the rocks, they, they need something to dig under. They won't just dig into the earth. So pretty much anything that you flip out in the landscape, there may it may very well be a fat tailed dunna, you know, habitat. So definitely woody debris um, is an amazing habitat for this species. Cool. So then you move on to saying ideal survey. There's been no targeted surveys for fat-tailed dunnarts uh, across the state. What is the best method for um, targeting fat-tailed dunnarts? Tile surveys are brilliant. I guess the problem there is that if you're predominantly, um, firstly, tiles need to be out in the ecosystem for no one quite knows how long is the best amount, but I would definitely say a few months. They need to actually be a habitat. So if you go put, you know, tiles in a landscape and survey them a week later, I wouldn't expect um, you to find much. And that is something that some ecological consultancies yeah. are being forced into, to be honest. it's it's They're being forced into because these bigger companies hire them and then they're like, okay, you've got a week to survey this whole area and you're not allowed to do it at night because that's against you know, our safety precautions. Well, the thing is that these are nocturnal species. They're not going to be just sitting on the surface in the middle of the day. So people will put tiles out. They need to be out there longer um, to get any kind of accurate reading. Flipping rocks, etc., is awesome. Spotlighting is the most common time you're going to find them out in the Wimmera region. So if people are out, I've had a lot of farmers who might be out fox shooting or that kind of thing, and, and they're, you know, recording them then. Like, what's that thing that kind of looks like a mouse, but it definitely looks different? Um, you know, that's when people are going to find them. Or, yeah, during the day, it's when you flip things and you're not quite expecting it. Cool. Awesome. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time, Emily. Really appreciate it. Fantastic presentation and getting amazing feedback on the chat there. So thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much uh, for having me. All right, so uh, sorry for the technical issues earlier on. We're going to move on and have uh, the little uh, uh, clip by Costa now. Emily might need to stop sharing her screen. I can still see that one. Sorry, I thought I stopped sharing a long time ago. <laughs> there you are. We got that right to go, guys. Just one second. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Hi, everyone. It's Costi here. And I just want to take a minute and say a big thank you to everyone associated with the Wimmera Biodiversity Seminar for asking me to become your first ambassador. From the moment that I first became connected with the seminar some four or five years ago now, I knew straight away that everything that you were doing was ahead of its time. You were really leading the way when it comes to the importance of looking after our biodiversity. The big picture, but then empowering and getting people engaged in their world. And I think what I love about it the most I've is got, that to do provide um, sound, but I, oh, for there it's local, in there. passionate, you can have a bit of a biodiversity of specialists across so many different fields to be able to be showcased and, and, and really celebrated within your community, but then further afield because of the reach and the gravity that your event creates. It really has, it has a weight, it has a value, and it has serious international significance. And I knew then, that's why I wanted to come. That's why I wanted to be involved. And I'm so humbled to be asked to, to come on board as an ambassador because, 
It's an opportunity to represent so many people that have supported all of the volunteers that have been involved, all of the speakers, all of that information and the research and the data that people have lovingly presented uh, to be able to, to represent that and help put the word out even further as an ambassador is an absolute honour. Oh, look, there's the, uh, there's the chickens just wandering by in the background. <laughs> Hello, girls. Um, so, look, I am I'm totally chuffed. I can't wait to uh, celebrate this year, the 23rd year, and uh, within, within no time, it will be a quarter of a century of, of work that is just priceless for the planet. So uh, from my heart to all of yours, a big, big thank you. And uh, here's to a great seminar in 2020. Fantastic. Thanks, Costa, for that one. It really is a great thing that we're doing here. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to Josh Griffiths. He's a wild, uh, senior wildlife ecologist um, with the research group Caesar and Enviro DNA. Josh is one of the foremost experts of platypus but, uh, and has conducted research all across Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales, into Queensland, Josh, maybe? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. A little bit, all over the place. Um, so Josh and Caesar have been pioneering the use of eDNA. Um, they used eDNA to survey for platypus for the first time in 2015 here in the Wimmera. So it was the first time in Australia here in the, in, in the Wimmera. Um, since then, they've been developing the technology to monitor a suite of species, platypus, fish, uh, and those type of things. So I'll pass it over to you now, Josh. Thanks, Ben. All right, let me uh, see. Hopefully, this is going to work. All right, hopefully everyone now can see... Uh, our focus animal on the screen now. Um, so yeah, so I like Emily, I'm not gonna talk too much about the, the threats and challenges that platypus make, uh, face, although I'm happy to sort of answer questions about it afterwards. I'm gonna talk more about the, the monitoring uh, of the species and, and using it sort of as a case study um, to highlight some of the challenges we have around monitoring biodiversity. Um, one, because it, it's my specialist species, so I've done quite a bit of work on it, um, but it's also it's a really good example of a, a species that's incredibly difficult to monitor and one that we really don't have good information on. So but let's just take a step back and think about, well, why do we actually need new um, new monitoring techniques, why do we need to innovate? So as ecologists and as land and waterway managers, we rely on good data about wildlife to understand what our impacts are, how we can implement appropriate management actions, and then also know whether these actions are working. But most wildlife are pretty elusive. Um, they can be very cryptic, um, nocturnal, etc., which means that some of our traditional um, monitoring techniques can be really difficult to actually detect these species. So a lot of traditional monitoring can produce some really great data. Um, and there's certainly some data that you can only get by, by capturing animals, but they can also be very time and labor intensive, which makes them expensive. And because none of us are working with unlimited budgets, it means that we can't necessarily do things as frequently or over a large enough scale that we would like. Um, they can also be invasive, so they can cause stress to our target animals as well as any bycatch um, and potentially to the environment as well. And they can be quite inefficient or lack sensitivity to detect species, whether they're at low abundance or whether they're a cryptic species. Um, some can just be incredibly difficult to capture. And all of this tends to lead to either a lack of data or false negatives where the species is present, but we're not necessarily able to detect it. And that means that our management decisions are based on incomplete data, which is always a, a, a worry. It also means that we don't really properly understand what some of the threats are or the magnitude of various threats, and also whether our management actions, once they've been implemented, are actually having the impact that we want them to. So that's why we sort of look at, at new techniques and something that's uh, sort of a good example is when uh, wildlife cameras sort of exploded about 20 years ago, they really revolutionised the way that we can monitor 
um, terrestrial species. And this is sort of the, the niche that we see eDNA fitting in, um, in aquatic systems. So platypuses are uh, one of the most difficult species that I've ever worked with. Um, they tend to be fairly sparsely distributed. Of course, they're nocturnal. Um, so traditionally, the way that we monitor them is using these nets here called fike nets. Um, as, as with most techniques like this, it's very time and labour intensive. These nets get set up in um, waterways at about five or six locations spaced over, um, you know, kilometres apart. It takes us most of the afternoon to set these nets up. Then they've got to get checked all through the night and then packed up at dawn. And I certainly know that when we've got uh, low abundance populations, I have a lot of difficulty even capturing platypuses. So um, the other issue we've got with this species is that we can't easily go out to waterways and just spot these guys. Um, when you do see them, they tends to be in low light or um, at a distance. They'll often just look like a stick floating in the water. They can also be very easily confused with this guy, which is our native Rakali, the water rat. Um, amazing species, looks very similar to a platypus at a distance. And then, of course, platypus are mostly active at night. So even though you do see them during the day, they spend about three quarters of their time active at night. And this means that any observation surveys automatically have very low probability of, of detecting platypuses. So these are some of the challenges that we face for this species. So having a look at the Wimmera region. So this is our, our Wimmera catchment, um, the top of the Grampians here, the main Wimmera River flowing through here and terminating in Lake Highmarsh at the top here. Now these orange dots represent all of the platypus records that we have from the whole Wimmera catchment on our major wildlife database. So the Atlas of Living Australia, there's about 60 records throughout the entire catchment here, and this is spanning about 100 years. So pretty sparse data. This is very typical with platypuses. Um, and, you know, this is one of the challenges we face when we're looking at historic data for platypuses. There's just not much around. But you can see, if you sort of join the dots, platypus were pretty widely distributed throughout the, the catchment. Um, they were existed in the lower Wimmera up until about 30 or 40 years ago. And in the upper Wimmera region, where there were some surveys done um, late 90s and early 2000s, they were still capturing reasonable numbers in this upper Wimmera um, in the early 2000s. Now, of course, we had a pretty significant drought in the early 2000s. So um, towards the end of that drought, there were some serious concerns about how platypus populations were going through this region. So we did some pretty widespread surveys throughout the area. So each of these grey dots is a, um, a spot that we've set our nets trying to capture platypuses. This was in 2008. It was estimated there was only a, a few percent of surface water available. So the Wimmera River had basically contracted to a few very isolated stagnant pools around the place. And unfortunately, what we found was this. We found one capture of a platypus in the upper Mackenzie River. So this part of the Mackenzie River had pretty permanent water supply. There were regular re releases from Lake Wartook, which then got diverted at the edge of the National Park along a channel to supply water to Horsham. So there was pretty permanent water in this region. And I believe this is the only reason that platypus were able to persist in that area. Now, once the drought finished, and I'll get back to the Mackenzie River population in a minute, but um, at the end of the drought, we had a couple of years of good rainfall. And so we, we tried again in this upper Wimmera region in about 2012, where we um, had much more water around the place. Again, did not find any platypuses with our live trapping techniques. So this was painting a bit of a, a grim picture. Around the same time, we started looking at a relatively new technique at the time called environmental DNA, which was sort of making waves around the world uh, in aquatic ecosystems. And basically the technique relies on uh, every species is shedding genetic material into the environment, whether that's through skin cells or hair cells, or for aquatic species, it can be urine and feces, um, scales and mucus from fish as well. But basically, um, there's genetic material in the environment and we can now take water samples, extract that DNA and use some species specific genetic markers to be able to tell you what species are present in, in the water samples. 
The advantages of this technique is, first of all, it's non-invasive, so you're not disturbing the species at all. It means you don't have to write animal ethics permits, which I'm sure no one enjoys. The sampling methodology is really simple, so we've been able to empower uh, Wimmera CMA to get out there and take their own samples. We've done, run citizen science projects, which is a great opportunity to engage the community in sort of their environment, but also um, broader river health issues. And I guess from a monitoring technique, it's one, it's, it's very cost effective to do, particularly over large spatial scales. And the critical thing is it's really highly sensitive, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. Here's a colleague of mine just demonstrating the water sampling. So very simple technique where it's just a matter of drawing water up into a syringe. We have these specialised filters that attach to the end of the syringe, and then you're just forcing water through this filter. The filter is incredibly fine and it captures all the cellular material and genetic material. This then goes back to the lab, and we have some very clever people in the lab that using these um, particular genetic markers, we can identify different species from, um, from those water samples. So I mentioned about high sensitivity before. Any monitoring technique is only as good as its ability to detect the species that it's after. So really you're looking for something that has a high probability of detecting your target species. And we were able to directly compare both our, our traditional trapping and our eDNA techniques. So we have our probability of detection on the, on the y-axis here and number of surveys along the bottom. This is our magical 95% detection rate that we're always trying to aim for. And so the number of surveys that we require from our live trapping to achieve that is between sort of six and 10 surveys. And a reminder, this is, these are overnight surveys that we have to conduct, but to have a high confidence of detecting platypus at any particular site, we've got to run between six and 10 surveys. So that's quite a significant effort. Now, if we look at that with our eDNA surveys, same axes here, we can take two water samples, run a couple of replicates in the lab, and we get about a 97 to 98% detection rate. So we have really high confidence of detecting platypus as if they're there. And conversely, if we're not picking them up, we've got really high confidence that they're not present. So that's critical for any monitoring technique and um, you know, really uh, quite a surprising result, um, I think, that it was actually that, that sensitive. And we've shown this with a number of different species as well, so a variety of fish species. So it's a very sensitive technique for detecting species. So if we go back to our Wimmera region, um, as Ben mentioned, the Wimmera CMA were very early adopters of this. They, they saw the value of it very early on. The first organisation in Australia, I think, to actually implement a monitoring program using environmental DNA. So we went back in um, 2015 and 16 and monitored a, a number of sites using eDNA. It was quite a dry year that year, so we were quite restricted to the remnant pool, so we couldn't survey as, as widespread as we wanted to. But again, unfortunately, no platypus turned up. In subsequent years, we did some more surveys with both Project Platypus and the CMA, did quite uh, a lot more extensive surveys throughout the region. Nothing has turned up in, in those areas. Now, I should say that we do still get occasional sightings of platypuses, particularly in this upper Wimmera region. I do suspect some of them are misidentification with Rakali, but I'm not discounting the possibility that there are some remnant individuals still hanging on around the place. They're an incredibly long-lived species. They'll live for sort of up to 20 years. Um, but I think the data very clearly shows that we don't have a functional population in these areas. So... Let's get back to where we do have platypuses in the Mackenzie River. So since 2008, we've been doing regular live trapping surveys through this area. Um, these dots just represent the survey effort that we've done with our, our netting. So the larger dot has, has had more nets set there over the years. And really, this is just to show you that we've had to concentrate our, our fike net surveys through this area here in the Grampians for a couple of reasons. One is that it's accessible, so we're actually able to get in there and put our nets. A lot of this is private property, which poses some challenges to be able to get in there regularly. But also in this more downstream region, we simply weren't picking up platypuses. So it was a decision to make to actually try to maximise our probability of catching animals by doing more surveys in this area. Um, there just wasn't much point continually setting nets in areas where we just had no evidence of platypus occurring. 
So after that 2016, we started implementing environmental DNA in this area as well. So using it to complement our live trapping, so focusing live trapping on where we're most likely to capture platypuses, and then doing much more widespread surveys using eDNA. So in 2017, our results, so the green is where we're picking up platypuses. Results showed exactly what we expected. So we saw platypus pretty um, widespread throughout this region in the, in the national park, and then really nothing downstream of there. In 2018, we started picking up platypus further downstream, right down to Tatlock's Bridge, where they hadn't been recorded for over a decade. 2019, I expanded further, further down to distribution heads. And in 2020, it's confirmed it again. So we've seen this gradual expansion of the population, which is fantastic for a number of reasons. One, it, it, it shows that our, our technique is being implemented in a really uh, great way and being able to detect that expansion. But it's also showing that this population is slowly recovering. It's still very small and isolated and vulnerable, but it's heading in that right direction. And it's responding to management action. So there's a a weir at the edge of the national park here that um, diverts a lot of water down a, a channel off to Horsham. Since about 2010, the CMA has implemented an environmental watering program that releases water down Mackenzie River to improve conditions. And we are now seeing the, the direct response of that from platypuses that are now expanding into these areas because conditions have improved. And hopefully we'll start to see them further on down down the creek as those populations keep um, keep growing. So we've now got a pretty clear understanding of, of platypus populations in the Wimmera region. Um, they're really just restricted to that Mackenzie River system now, and that enables us to make our make correct management decisions um, on how we manage those populations into the future. So I'm not going to get into that, but I guess what I wanted to highlight is that um, not only do we have good information in the Wimmera region. But this is also contributing to uh, one, it was critical for um, a, a recent nomination for platypus to be listed as vulnerable in Victoria. So the Wimmera data was absolutely critical for that. And that, that nomination has now been accepted by the state government. Well, it's been recommended by the state government. We're still waiting on final acceptance. But it's also forming part of a much larger program that I'm running called the Great Australian Platypus Search, which is then expanding this data out to this kind of scale. So the largest platypus survey that's ever been undertaken by a, a huge amount, uh, we're covering a massive area. I think we're up to about 1,500 sites that we've surveyed. Um, and we'll pro provide some really good data about the conservation status and the threats that they face. So I'm going to step away from platypus now and talk about a few other species that we've also done some uh, work with in the area. So uh, carp. Now, you might think, why are we trying to look for carp? They're everywhere through the system. Uh, we don't need new techniques to pick them up because they're overabundant. Exactly right. A very different technique here. We weren't looking at trying to identify where carp were. We were more trying to identify areas of high carp abundance so that we can then target uh, control methods. So if you can target where, where you've got the most carp, you get the best bang for your buck. So first of all, we wanted to work out whether our, the amount of DNA that we find in our water samples is um, related to the number of carp that are present. So we worked with um, Austral Research and Consulting uh, and matched up our eDNA surveys with some electrofishing. And what we found, there was a very clear positive correlation between the amount of DNA and carp abundance. So we, we know that if we um, quantify the amount of DNA in that waterway, if we're getting high DNA concentrations, that equates to high uh, carp abundance. And so we can map out carp abundance along a waterway, see where they've got highest numbers and the kind of environmental triggers that are, um, uh, that are related to that. And interestingly, from these surveys, we actually found um, breeding areas as well, which were just off the scale. It was an order of magnitude higher than what we found anywhere else in the waterway. And breeding areas are a critical um, area to target for control efforts. If you can stop carp breeding, obviously, it's going to be out of control numbers fairly significantly. And following on from this, we've then been able to actually test effectiveness of removal techniques by looking at DNA concentrations before and after removal to 
be able to show that, okay, if we're removing a ton of carp from a waterway, is it actually having an impact or are they simply just moving in from, from um, surrounding areas? And just finally, one of the other projects that we did was um, this is actually a citizen science project where uh, the CMA was engaging with the local and we had a, a couple of keen anglers that sort of spent a day chuffing down the river near Dimboola collecting water samples for us. And then we looked for a couple of key native species here, yellow belly and the eel-tailed catfish. And these red markers are where we picked up the respective species. Um, we did this a few times, look at how that distribution was changing over time and being able to identify critical habitats for both these species. Um, this is just a good example about how it can be used as a, as a community engagement and citizen science tool. So just finally, eDNA has been a really valuable new tool that we now have in our toolkit to understand wildlife populations. Like all techniques, it has some really strong advantages, but also some limitations. So the fact that we've got more tools can only be a good thing. So once we're clear about what it is we're trying to investigate, what's our key question, we can then choose from that toolkit what's the most appropriate technique that we want to use. And critically, then designing a sampling regime that's going to have both the sensitivity and power to properly answer that question. So for myself as a platypus ecologist, eDNA has been amazing. It's enabled us to do things at a scale that we've never been able to achieve before. Um, and certainly it's, it's, it's having good applications for a number of other species as well. But it um, goes into our, our toolkit that we can then sort of hopefully understand more about our wildlife populations and be able to manage them properly because as we've heard just previously, that they're all under a little bit of pressure and, and we really need to um, manage our uh, waterways and lands a bit better so that we've got our, our unique species into the future. So thanks very much for listening and um, yeah, certainly happy to answer any questions. Fantastic, thank you very much, Josh. Um, so I've got one question here. Someone asked, um, can we use eDNA on microbat poo to determine the species? And I suppose more broadly, um, we're starting to see eDNA used in a terrestrial uh, environment. Can you talk to that a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. So eDNA is very good for aquatic environments because the DNA sort of travels and the water sampling is quite easy. In terrestrial environments, it's a little bit more challenging. The, tech, the, uh, the concept is still the same. But DNA doesn't move, so it's a lot more patchily distributed. Things like scats are basically a, a, a biological method of concentrating DNA. So you can, um, one, you can actually identify the species that created the scats. So you can sort of swab the surface of scats to um, identify the species. And we've actually been doing it with fox scats recently to be able to identify individuals. Um, so that's been really exciting. And then we can also break open the scat and use eDNA to look at what's, what's the diet. So one as a diet study for the species that produce the scat, but also as a way to look for rare mammals. So as um, Emily mentioned before, looking at our pellets to try to identify dunnarts, you can actually do that genetically as well. Mm, fantastic. Multiple applications for it. Um, so I suppose uh, a loaded question coming from me from the CMA, but uh, so what's the next steps for um, managing platypus in the Wimmera? Um, yeah, look, it's it's definitely a challenging one. So the fact that they've disappeared from the vast majority of the catchment um, certainly isn't great. And if you look at that, particularly that upper Wimmera region, I would probably argue that that area is no longer suitable to actually support platypus populations because of the flow regimes. The waterway regularly stops flowing. Um, and we know that once we get extended cease to flow events, if we get them regularly, the capacity to support a resident population dramatically declines. So. The good thing is we still have a source population. So I think working from that, I mean, the first priority is to protect that, that area and then sort of slowly trying to expand suitable habitat from there to encourage natural dispersal. So that's going to be the first, first area. And where we've got permanent water in that lower Wimmera, um, you know, there's certainly hope to recolonise that um, if we can improve conditions. The other challenge we've got is that 
because they've declined to such a small isolated population, we're starting to see inbreeding within that area. So they're, they're starting to um, decline in genetic diversity, which has really big implications for long-term persistence. So genetic diversity basically allows us to adapt to environmental change. And we know that once you start losing that genetic diversity, the, ex the risk of extinction increases. So provided we can, we're confident that the existing population is going to persist and be there for a long term, the next step would be, can we start translocating animals from different populations in there to introduce new genetics and improve the, the viability of that population? Fantastic. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Write it up. We'll start tomorrow. Yeah, good. Excellent. Um, now, I've had one final question. Someone's just asked about the cost uh, cost of D, uh, eDNA, um, and then maybe, I suppose, can you compare that to the cost of, say, a uh, live trapping um, survey? Um, yeah, in fact, we've got a paper out addressing that exact same thing, if they really want to want to read that. Um, but so it, it's, it's hard to directly compare because it depends on, you know, what you're kind of looking at. But so eDNA surveys, so typically for if we've already got our genetic markers developed, which we have for about 40 or 50 different species now, it's just a matter of uh, once we've got the samples, the laboratory costs, um, it varies a bit depending on how many samples we can do um, because there's economies of scale, but roughly about 100 bucks a sample to screen for a particular species. Um, and as I sort of showed earlier, we generally look at about two samples per site for platypus. So a couple of hundred bucks to provide, um, you know, really high confidence of, of detecting platypus. Um, but the key thing is, I guess, designing that sampling regime. So I guess you're never going to go out to a waterway and just sort of take uh, water samples at, at a particular location. It's about designing a, a regime that's going to answer your question, which might be, a hundred sites across a landscape or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, hopefully that sort of helps a, a little bit. Yeah. But in terms of, yeah, it's an order of magnitude cheaper at the same scale kind of thing. So, yeah. So I guess if we're looking at so an overnight survey, um, you know, we're setting nets at about five locations. If we're doing eDNA surveys at those same five locations, you're looking at about, say a thousand bucks, whereas a, a survey is probably going to be two or three times that yeah. live trapping one. So, yeah, live trapping. Fantastic. Um, and we've had a few requests for that paper. So if you can send us a link to that paper, Josh, and we will uh, post it, I suppose, on the biodiversity seminar, if, that, if you're happy to do that. Oh, sure. Uh, yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much, Josh. Another enthralling presentation. Um, and thank you again to Emily as well. Great job. And uh, we look forward to seeing you both in the Wimmera doing some surveys on those fantastic species. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so that brings us to the close of today's um, uh, seminar. So thank you for everyone for showing up. Um, and listening. And again, I encourage you to please go and fill out the survey. Um, Mel has just posted the link in the comments there. So can we please get a few people uh, to do that? Uh, and then also don't forget, last week is our fifth and final presentation. We, uh, When we're talking about biodiversity uh, and threatened species in the Wimmera, we can't not talk about orchids. So we've got uh, a couple of orchid specialists, Nushka um, and... Alison coming in next week. So I really look forward to that and talking about orchids and their uh, relationship with fungi. So thanks again. Thanks to Emily. Thanks to Josh. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Have a lovely day and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, everyone. Oh, thank you. Cracker.